you're destined to win. We gotta turn it around. Hi, I'm Pastor Frank Santora, and I wanna welcome you to Destined to Win. Have you ever tried to break a bad habit or start a new one with no success at all? Well, what if I told you that you don't need stronger willpower, you just need to literally change your mind. Every thought, every action, every reaction we have creates ruts in the brain, and it creates a track that we unconsciously follow, whether we intend to or not. I hope you'll join me today as I share with you how you can retrain your mind in our series, Mental Health Goals. Today what I want to do is go forward. I want us to now go from post-imagining to pre-imagining or looking into our future with that same lens of God's providence and God's goodness. And so through post-imagining, we reframe our past, but through pre-imagining, we pre-frame our future. And this is not psychological mumbo jumbo, right? Because sometimes if you hear like some of these big words, and I don't know if they're big words for you, but for some people I guess they are, and cognitive bias and all of that kind of stuff, you can think, oh, that's just psychological mumbo jumbo. No, it's actually biblical principle. And we find this biblical principle of post-imagining or pre-framing your future right here in what we call the Hall of Faith. And the Hall of Faith is that chapter in the Bible, Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 11, that talks about the exploits of all of the heroes of our faith, all of the great things that they accomplished for the Lord. And I want to walk through the first four verses very, very specifically. Verse number one again says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Now without doing a massive amount of teaching on what faith is, if you read this particular verse in many other translations, you begin to get a sense of what faith is. And it basically is an absolute assurance or a confident expectation that what God has said or promised will come to pass in your life. It's not a might happen. It's not a maybe will happen. It is an absolute assurance that it is going to come to pass. And that kind of absolute assurance is tied to our understanding or our relationship of who our Father is. When we have confidence and trust in our Father, when he says something, we fully expect for that to come to pass, right? And if we don't fully expect it to come to pass, it's because we don't know our father very, very well. It's sort of like a husband and a wife. If your wife or your husband says, I'll be there at such and such a time or I'm going to do this, you don't think twice about it. You have confidence that they're going to get it done because you know them and you know them intimately. And so God wants us to know him intimately. And when we know him intimately, we have a confident assurance that what he promises or what he says will come to pass in our life. No matter what the obstacles are or what the evidence is that is contrary to that. Faith is an absolute assurance that what God said will come to pass. Now Hebrews chapter 11 verse number 2 says, For by it, by what? By faith, the elders obtained a testimony. All right, They used their faith in God, their absolute assurance that what God said would come to pass and, and to, to, to see their tests become testimonies. In other words, they literally stood by or held on to the word of God no matter what obstacles came their way and they didn't allow their circumstances to change the word of God, but they allowed the word of God to change their circumstances. How many of you know that's a good word right there? Too many people allow their circumstances to change and alter the word of God. That's the generation that we live in right now. We live in a generation that basically says, well, if this is happening, then God's word can't mean that. No, God's word is supposed to alter and change your situation. And so what these Old Testament patriarchs did is they stood by. And, and a good example would be a junkyard dog or a bulldog. By the way, our school is the Faith Prep Bulldogs. Do you know why we're called the Bulldogs? Because bulldogs have a snout that is slanted this way. Right? You ever notice? Or actually, it's that way. You know why they have a snout that's slanted this, uh, that's slanted this way? Is because they can hold on to something and breathe at the same time. 
So they'll never let go of what they are holding on to. And actually when the Bible says now faith is the substance of things hoped for, it literally means holding on to the word of God no matter what. No matter what tries to steal the word of God from your heart, from your mind, from your situation. You hold on to that thing and you keep breathing because you know ultimately God's promise is going to come to pass because he watches over his word waiting to perform it in our lives, right? So verse 1, this is what faith is. Verse 2, this is what faith does. Faith gives us testimonies. It brings us through tests. It changes the circumstances. Verse 3, skip it for just a minute, and then go to verse number 4. By faith, we understand, or by faith, so-and-so did this, and by faith, so-and-so did that, and by faith, verse number four on, it's all of the people who did these things by faith, and so we learn about Abel, and Enoch, and, and Noah, and Abraham, and Sarah, and Moses, and Gideon, and Samson, not to mention David, and Esther, and Ruth, and Rahab, and so many more. So from verse 4 on to the end of the chapter, we find out about all of the testimonies that these people who obtained good reports from the Lord by faith accomplished. But then there's this one little verse, verse number 3, that kind of seems strange in the context. The context is saying this is what faith is. Second part of the verse is saying this is what faith does. And then from verse 4 on, we find out all of the testimonies. But verse number 3 says this, by faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. And when we read that, we read that as if the rest of the context in the chapter is not there, and we think this verse is simply an, uh, a, a shout out to God speaking the world into existence. Now, how many of you know God did speak the world into existence? That's a fact, right? God, in creation, and God said, blah, 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 and it was so. And God said, blah, 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 and it was so. And God said, blah, 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 and it was so. So indeed, God did, by his word, speak the world into existence. And by the way, if you are like your heavenly father, your words are a creative force, right? But this verse is not talking about God creating the worlds. Matter of fact, look at it carefully. Say, Pastor, how do you know that? Well, there are three Greek words that are used in translated worlds in the Bible. The first Greek word is the Greek word geise, G-A-Y-S-E. And it means, geise means uh, uh, the, the, the earth, the world that, that we see, geise. The second one is the word cosmos, C-O-S-M-O-S, -O -S, and it means universe. Now, God did create the earth, geise, and the cosmos, universe. But this Word that is used here, worlds, is neither geise nor cosmos. It is the third Greek word that can be translated worlds, and it is the word ionos, A-I-O-N-O-S, and it means periods of time in man's history. And so when you look at that, this verse is telling us how through faith, standing by God's word, no matter what the obstacles they encountered were, these particular Bible greats affected the periods of history that they lived through. And notice what it says. It says they framed. Notice they, they framed the worlds by the word of God. They, they got a word from God, and they saw obstacles all around them. But they held on to that word of God like, like a bulldog would hold on to a bone and keep breathing. They had, and everything would try to steal that word from them. But they held on and they held on and they held on. And the word of God changed their circumstances and they shaped or they changed the history of the world by holding on. How many of you know if you will hold on to a word from God for your life, you will change your circumstances? They framed despite what their future looked like. They framed it to come into alignment with the word of God. What was Noah's obstacle? He had never seen it rain. 
Never rained before. That was his obstacle. Abraham's obstacle. He was 100 years old. Esther's obstacle. She would be put to death if she went to go see the king. Rahab's ob uh, uh, obstacle. She was a prostitute. Elijah's obstacle. He suffered from depression and was outnumbered by the prophets of Baal. Joshua's obstacle. There were huge walls in front of him. Moses' obstacle. He had a Red Sea in front of him, and he had an Egyptian army behind him. David's obstacle. There was a giant in front of him, and he was just a shepherd boy. Mary's obstacle. She was a virgin. Joseph's ob obstacle. He was in prison. Ruth's obstacle. She was a poor widow woman who had nothing. Peter's obstacle. He denied Christ. Paul's obstacle. He was a murderer. But despite all of the obstacles, they got a word from God, and they held on to that word from God, and they changed their future from a word from God. You have to pre-frame your future. Pre-frame it. Hold on to it no matter what is happening in your life? Stand by it. Guard it. Keep it in your heart. Keep it in front of your eyes. Understand God is watching over his word, waiting to perform it. If your obstacle is being broke, pre-imagine yourself blessed coming and going. If your obstacle is depressed, pre-imagine yourself full of joy. If your obstacle is sickness, pre-imagine yourself healed and whole. If your obstacle is a bad marriage, pre-imagine yourself in a flourishing, flourishing marriage. If your obstacle is being discouraged because it's taken too long for your dream to come to pass, pre-imagine yourself fulfilling your destiny. Whatever your obstacle is, you need to pre-imagine, which is how you pre-frame your future so your future comes into alignment with the promises of God. Pre-frame your future. Imagination is powerful. Let me give you some simple pre-decisions that will help you. Number one, I will obey God no matter how difficult the situation is. Pre-decide. For it confronts it, conf you're confronted with pre-decide. I will attend church every single weekend. Pre-decide. So this way, what happens? Well, how am I going to fit this in and that in? And how am I going to? No, I go to church. I fit everything else in. Easy. Makes, makes life so much simpler to do that. Every dollar that comes into my life, I'll give God a dime. I don't even have to think about it, right? Here comes that big million dollar check. Bam, 100000 going right to God. Just make the decision, right? I'll stay faithful to God. I'll treat my body as the temple of the Holy Spirit. I'll tell the truth even when it's hard. This is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it no matter how difficult it is. When trials come my way, I will count it all joy. I will count my blessings instead of my troubles. I'll honor my spouse. I'll raise my children in the ways of the Lord. I'll put God first in all things. Pre-decide. Make the decision before you have to make the decision. Where do we see this in the Bible? We see it in the life of Joseph. Joseph made a pre-decision to not sleep with Potiphar's wife. Check out what the Bible says about this. Watch this. It says, um, Frank was handsome and, well, and a well-built young man. Oh, oh, Joseph was very handsome and a well-built young man. And Potiphar's wife soon began to look at him lustfully. Come and sleep with me, she demanded. But Joseph refused. Look, he told her, my master trusts me with everything in his entire household. No one has more authority than I do. He has held back nothing from me except you because you're his wife. Makes sense to me, except maybe not in this culture. Anyway, how can I do such a wicked thing? It would be a great sin against God. She kept putting pressure on Joseph day after day. Watch this. But he refused to sleep with her, and he kept out of her way as much as possible. Did you notice that last part? He kept out of her way. What was he doing? Predecided. He was predecided. I'm not putting myself in temptation, right? It's like the people, you know, God delivered them from alcohol. And, like, they think they could just go hang out at bars. Oh, it's not going to affect me. Dummy. Right? What, what, what do you have to do? You have to pre-decide 
not to cooperate with the enemy. And I love it. Not only did he pre-decide, but notice how he spoke of the sin. He called it wicked and evil and disloyal and against God and against his. Can we start calling sin what it is instead of renaming it? It is the devil's ploy so that we find it easier to do it. Call it what it is. It's not a different choice. It's not a culturally acceptable, well, you know, I was listening to a preacher last night. I was just flipping through Instagram. This preacher once preached the gospel. Now he's talking about how, you know, the gospel of Christianity where people are, you know, uh, call sin, sin, and this, that, and this, that, and the other thing. It's, it's becoming outdated because we are, not, we, are, we, not, we are not progressing in our consciousness. I want to reach through and say, stop. Right? Call it what it is, pre-decide. Now what happens? When Joseph pre-decided, right, one day he was ready for it. He, he wasn't as uh, susceptible because he was ready. Verse number 11 of chapter 39, one day, however, no one else was around. By the way, we teach this all the time. Never think you're big enough, powerful enough to put yourself in a compromising situation and not fall. So we teach people this all the time. We'll be alone with somebody who's the opposite sex. Oh, yeah, but, you know, we pray in the Holy Ghost. Never. Why? Because that's the devil's playground. This is what, so one day, however, no one else was around. When she went in to do her work, when he went in to do his work, she came and she grabbed him by the cloak. How many of you know the devil is aggressive? Devil's reaching through the TV and grabbing some of y'all right now. He's reaching through the educational system and grabbing some of y'all right now. He's reaching through your friends and grabbing some of y'all right now. So one day, he, she came, she grabbed him by the coat, demanding, come and sleep with me. Joseph tore himself away, but he left his cloak in her hand and he ran from the house. Why? He had pre-decided. Don't wait until you have to make the decision to make the decision. Because if you wait till you have to make the decision to make the decision, you will fall to the decision. But if you pre-decide the decision and you pre-decide that over and over and over, you pre-imagine your future as running from sin. You pre-imagine your future as pleasing God. You pre-imagine your future as standing and doing what is right before God. When the opportunity comes, you will run. Pre-decide. Third thing and last thing I want to share with you, and I know I'm going a little bit long, but number three, to preframe your future, you need to plant your seed. I, I, I read about this, this crazy scientist who decided that he was going to go and seed the clouds. And, and he was going to make it snow. And he, so he took up carbon dioxide into a plane, big load of carbon dioxide. He released it when he was up in the clouds. And onlookers said that the cloud exploded. And they could see snowfall from 40 miles away. Because he, he seeded the clouds. Seeding the clouds is similar to planting seeds, which spiritually seeking is taking proactive measures today that will produce desired outcomes tomorrow. Scripture teaches us that what we sow today, we see tomorrow. Let me say it again. Scripture teaches us that what we sow today, we will see tomorrow. A bright future is not magic. A bright future is comprised of the things that we talked about, but also sowing seeds today that will produce desired outcomes tomorrow. Ecclesiastes 11.1, cast your bread upon the waters, for you will find it after many days. In other words, what I do today is going to impact my tomorrow. Well, how do I know what seeds to sow today? You reverse engineer the process. What is reverse engineering? It's beginning with the end in mind. That's what God does, right? That's why conception doesn't happen at birth, because that would be the opposite of reverse engineering. Reverse engineering is start with the outcome, that's birth, and back up. So God thinks, hmm, what do I want this person to do? What do I want them to look like? What talents do I want them to have? Reverse engineering, what does he do? He begins to sow all that into that person. Then all that grows when it's in the womb, and then poop, there's the outcome. Poop, there it is. Right, that was funny right there. Reverse engineer. Noah started with making it through a worldwide flood. That was the promise. Then he backed up, and you know what he did? He built an ark. According to rabbinical tradition, 
Noah planted trees when he got the promise so that they would grow so you have lots of planks to build the ark. Remember, they lived to like a 1,000 in those days, right? I don't know what that looked like, but I don't know. Begin with the end of mind. Let me give you a few seeds that everybody can sow today that you'll see tomorrow so you can have God's future tomorrow. Number one, humility. That's the seed you need for God's favor. How many of you know you cannot do anything or accomplish anything without God's favor? It's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Unless God breathe on it, unless God makes it happen, it cannot come to pass if it's the dream that God has for you. Psalm 90, verse 17 says, May the favor of the Lord our God rest on us, establish the work of our hands. Yes, establish the work of our hands. God's favor is what establishes it. How do you get God's favor? Isaiah 66, verse 2. These are the ones that I look on with favor those who are humble and have a contrite spirit. Give me some time to teach on humility some other time, but it's not what we think it is. Because you have a lot of people who are outwardly humble but inwardly arrogant. Oh, I'm really not that good at that. First of all, it's a lie if you are, right? Like if somebody comes to me and goes, Pastor, that was a great message. You're, you're such a wonderful preacher. No, I'm really not that good. First of all, that would be a lie. It's funny right there, right? That's false humility, right? You, true humility is when you understand that it's God who's given you the gift and that you understand. Do you know how many times, even before I walk out here, I say, God, unless you show up, unless you go with me, God, I can't do this. God, I need you. I need you to breathe. I need you to talk. I need you to speak to my mind, touch my heart, communicate through my lips. True, true humility is something that is inward more than it is a big show outwardly, but it's the seed you sow today for God's favor tomorrow. Generosity, the seed you need for double blessing. Generosity is the seed you need for double blessing. You'll never be able to accomplish the future God has for you without finances. God's dream for you is always bigger than the finances you possess. If you can do it on what you have, you're not flowing with God. You're, you're not getting the next phase of the dream. Because you never just arrive and God goes, okay, good enough. God always keeps adding to it, right? And so in order for you to get finances in your future, you need to be generous today. Given it will be given back to you. How? Good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over. Shall men give on to your bosom for with the same measure that you use, it will be measured to you again. If you want finances in your future, you need to be generous today. Obedience, third seed. It's the seed you need for overflow. Obedience today sets you over, up for overflow tomorrow. What was Joseph? Obedient. He said, I'm going to obey even when it's hard. I'm going to do what God wants me to do, even when to do the opposite of what God wants me to do would be easy. And that obedience, what it do? It overflowed into his life. It didn't look like it was working. How many of you know sometimes obedience doesn't look like it's working? Right? Give you a practical example. You diet all week. You get on the scale. It moves point two. You go, oh, it's not working. Yes, it is. Stay faithful to it. Obedience is the seed you sow today for overflow in the future. Then you do it another week and you get, oh, I lost three pounds as we praise God, right? That's what happens with obedience. It has a cumulative effect. It creates overflow in the future. So your mind matters more than you thought, right? In order to change your life, you have to change your mind. But can it only be accomplished when you use God's mighty weapons. If you'd like some additional encouragement, I've not only prepared some audio lessons, but a practical study guide as well to aid you in your journey to accomplishing your mental health goals. Check this out. Your mind matters more than you think. If you have ever tried to break bad habits, tried to establish better relationships, or tried to follow through on resolutions without success, then there is good news for you. It's not a matter of increasing your willpower, it's a matter of changing your mind. In his Mental Health Goals Volume 1 study guide set, Pastor Frank Santora explores the mighty weapons God has given us to eliminate bad habits and repeal the cycles that keep defeating us. This first volume not only includes three powerful digital audio lessons on a USB drive, but also a companion study guide booklet with fill-in notes and prompts for your personal study. This first volume is available alone for your gift of $20 to the ministry. 
But if you would like to take the next step to replace the old habits and thoughts with new ones, Volume 2 introduces the mighty renewing weapons in four additional lessons that reinforce that what you see in your mind and say with your mouth, you will do with your life. For your gift of $40 to the ministry, you will receive both Volumes 1 and 2 for a total of seven digital lessons and two companion study guide booklets to help you achieve your mental health goals. Just visit franksantora.cc to order today. Focusing on our mental health is not a new idea. God has already laid out how we can deal with these struggles right in His Word. So be encouraged. You do have the ability to change your mind and rewire your brain to form beneficial habits, but only when you rely on God's wisdom and strength. And that's all possible because with Jesus, you're destined to win. in the New York City or Connecticut area, we invite you to visit us at one of our locations or join us online every Sunday at faithchurch.cc live. On behalf of Pastor Frank and from all of us at Faith Church, God bless you, we love you, and we'll see you next week.